Welcome to the last panel. Congratulations, y'all, for being here. You stayed here for the entire three days, flew from wherever you flew from, and now you're here. That is persistence right there. You guys are all alpha seekers, and we are in a bear market, so even more so. So I'm going to introduce the other panelists. This is going to be one of the most important panels that you're going to sit in on, because we're talking about protocol privacy. We've we're not going to talk about all of the technology because you've heard enough of that. We're going to talk about the philosophy and why we're here building the things we're building. So please welcome panelists. We've got Michael Perklin from Shapeshift. Uh, Daniel from NIM, Privacy Tech. And we've got Yusuf from Masari. Yeah. OK, very cool. So welcome to the panel. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves first so people understand your background. All right. So my name is uh, Yusuf Amrani. Uh, I previously worked at uh, Mesari, uh, mainly covering infrastructure and uh, DeFi. Uh, right now, I'm a Cosmos Hub contributor. Um, I've uh, contributed uh, and helped with the, the design and the writing of the, the Atom 2.0 white paper. I hope you uh, all enjoyed the new world map. Uh, I'm also an economic, uh, a member of the economic committee uh, for uh, Interprotocol, which is developing the uh, IST stablecoin uh, on, built on Agoric. Uh, so why I am in uh, crypto, I think this is a, an important question. It, it, it is the why. Uh, the first reason um, I was very attracted uh, by this technology and how it enables to uh, reframe how we, uh, we human beings coordinate as a, as a society, how we opt in uh, to a system in a, in a permissionless uh, fashion, I think that is uh, profound. Anyone can um, basically come to a network, opt in, contribute, create value uh, without any fear of discrimination or coercion. So I think this inclusiveness is appealing to all of us. And that is opposed, for example, to a technology like AI that if put uh, in the wrong hands uh, can increase control of centralized entity over the human being um, by basically reducing uh, their power. Uh, and then there was this analogy that I really liked from um, Peter Thiel, PayPal co-founder, where he, do, did, um, he wrote the, the foreword for the book, The Sovereign Individual. And uh, he said basically, if um, AI is communist, then crypto is libertarian. And I think it perfectly sums up um, what we are all here for. And then the second reason, uh, that attracted me to, to, uh, to crypto, basically it says that I think the censorship resistant aspect and the P2P aspect of, of, uh, of crypto are super important, underrated. Uh, so Bitcoin in 2009 paved the way for Web3 as we know it today. Bitcoin, it, it all started with Bitcoin because it was the first time that any individual could access uh, digital, proper, digital property. So in the, in the Web2 world, where, how I see it is that users were just tenants. So you, own your, you, you don't own your Twitter account, you don't own your Facebook account, you don't own your Amazon account. You can be kicked out at any moment because you're not compliant. Uh, and that Bitcoin was the first step to enabling the Web3 world where basically we move from a model where we just tenants to a model where we have full ownership uh, over data, assets, etc. Yes, it was. And Daniel here, he is bilingual, but primary, primar primarily a Spanish speaker. So uh, he's going to be speaking Spanish throughout most of this. So. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Sorpresa. Me llamo Daniel. Eh, participo en NIM. Um, no sé si os dé tiempo a poneros el sistema de traducción a algunas personas para comprender lo que voy a decir, pero también creo que es importante que en este, este evento, evento se hable en castellano, castellano para una audiencia de América Latina, Latina que también está muy pendiente de este evento y a algunos les cuesta mucho entenderlo. 
y apenas el 5 o el 6% ha sido en esta lengua. Entonces me disculparéis, pero voy a dedicarme un poco también para esta lengua. has been spoken in Spanish. I'm so sorry for all the people who don't speak Spanish. Now is your turn. Is your turn to understand what Spanish language people is feeling in, during this meeting. So, so I'm so sorry, sorry but I go, go on Spanish. Spanish if you, you don't mind. mind. Thank you for being so nice. Um, yo eh, trabajo para Nimtech. Nimtech es una compañía de las muchas compañías que están trabajando. Es un proyecto. Para It's crear a project las siguientes generaciones to create the next generation of network and informatic systems that will allow us to have better privacy for people because privacy is one of the most important aspects of the future. It's a human right that should be guaranteed by the states and backed up by the companies. But unfortunately, this is not like this. And this doesn't need explanation, but you are aware of how this works for the big transnational companies of the cognitive capital world or for the states, how important it is, who we are, what we're doing, what we like. So we work to offer a layer of privacy. We believe that the internet has been broken. The idea of internet is to have better communication, but not to have more privacy. When we use signal or other systems that we consider safe, the PNI PMP system and the design of that network uses metadata that makes us difficult to be anonymous. And the idea of Mintech is to do something similar to Thor, but with steroids. I use Thor for a long time now. It's one of the best projects in the planet. And Thor knew that there were certain books that after a few decades, they would have been thought like an utopy, but right now they are a reality. The idea is try to correct these failures and give the opportunity for many people that they want to continue anonymous and private. I'm in the world of crypto because I love biodiversity. I believe that humanity has been trained to crash that biodiversity and to be an advocate um, many people have to work on this in the United States, Russia, Iran, Colombia. We consider them safe, but they are not. They criminalize and put people in jail that are dedicated to protect life. The people that uh, speak for the environment, that work for the environment, many of them have been murdered uh, around the world. Uh, mostly in Latin America. We need to give those people technologies so that they can fight for life. They have to be able to filter information or maybe some activists are doing, maybe they are researching deforestation or illegal mining and that are destroying the planet. So we have to give them tools. Right here, we have the Amazon area, and many people are dying because they're trying to be advocators in pro of the Amazon. So we have to protect them. They should be able to get pictures, use drones, and they can be able to write documents anonymously. They are risking their lives. So that's one of the main reasons why I use encryptation technology for more than 20, 30 years. The last time I said this in Medellin in a public museum, the police <laughs> and the, the intelligence services uh, captured me. So a few years ago, you could not speak about this that we had to use cryptography for your mail and try to be anonymous because you were trying to make the world better, you would end up in jail. So 
uh, we are here not because we're very clever. No, because we're on the shoulder of giants. There have been two previous generations that have uh, design, open source, protocols, Linux, etc. And today we're building on them other layers to try to fight this battle, battle against the financing system. To give Sorry. his intro first. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chango, for having me here on this panel, and thank you to the Cosmoverse team for uh, making such an amazing uh, conference together. Um, uh, my name is Michael Perklin. I work with the Shapeshift DAO, and I'm the leader of the Foxchain Workstream. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Well, welcome our panelists. <laughs> All right. So, uh, in, 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 uh, in the consciousness of time, maybe let's just keep our answers to concise two minutes per question. All right, so let's start. Yusuf, why is, in, why is crypto important for freedom? Two minutes. All right. Um, so I'd say we talk a lot about uh, decentralization in crypto uh, and not enough about uh, disintermediation. I think that they go hand in hand if we want to make uh, crypto uh, successful. So uh, I'll just give one example uh, that happened uh, a few centuries ago, actually in the, in the 15th, uh, at the beginning of the 15th century, uh, where Gutenberg invented the, the printing press, uh, and that was, I think, a huge innovation and, in, and invention. So what happened before is that um, the church had uh, a, a total control over um, what was publicly available in terms of writing uh, because everything was uh, written by hand and so the elite of, uh, from the church uh, they were uh, serving their own interest and just giving more uh, focus on, on the Bible and that was all that was available uh, basically in a, there, was, there were no bookstore but the equivalent so there was basically the church was uh, a gatekeeper between knowledge uh, and the people. And so when Gutenberg came in and invented the printing press, uh, it enabled uh, massive, massive uh, knowledge distribution, uh, access and inclusiveness. Suddenly anyone can, could uh, write a book and distribute it at scale, which was not possible before. Uh, and that was, I think, very, very uh, important. And so I see crypto basically, uh, the, the, the invention uh, of, uh, of, of crypto I think is as important as uh, the invention of the printing press because it puts uh, the power in the hands uh, of the people. Right. Michael, I'm glad you're on this panel because your history at Shapeshift kind of informs the way that you perceive the world today. So how has that experience in dealing with regulators and working in a company that is effectively a central point of failure uh, shaped your worldview about why we need decentralization? Yeah, uh, a great question. Um, uh, first off, a, a, a quick question uh, to the audience. How many of you have heard of Shapeshift? Uh, some hands? Okay. Um, uh, for those of you who, who, who don't, uh, Shapeshift began in 2014 as a way to exchange crypto assets. But what made Shapeshift unique was that it did it as frictionlessly as possible. If you had, for example, Ether and you wanted Bitcoin, you go to the website and say, I have Bitcoin, I want Ether. You send Bitcoin, you get Ether. All uh, w within a minute. Uh, no KYC, no sign up. Uh, it was the, the easiest way to swap assets uh, online. Um, over the years, as the crypto industry matured, uh, regulations um, uh, began making this more difficult for, uh, for any company that wanted to make it easy for users to quickly swap assets. Um, Shapeshift was forced to add accounts, user accounts, and have you give your personal information to Shapeshift your scan of your passport, utility bills, all the things that you would uh, uh, need to prove your identity so that you would now have the privilege of swapping Bitcoin for Ether with a click. When Shapeshift made that choice uh, to comply with these regulations, 
our volume dropped by over 90%. Overnight, people stopped using Shapeshift, and um, I was actually speaking with, uh, with a gentleman last night who said, yeah, I, I've sort of stopped following your story. I have no idea what Shapeshift is doing today. Uh, in response to this, Shapeshift had a choice. We can pivot or we can die. And nobody can win the war uh, on privacy and open access if you choose to leave the battle. So Shapeshift chose to pivot, and today Shapeshift is much different. Where we began as a exchange, today Shapeshift is a platform, a, a simple website that you can plug in your keys. Uh, how many of you use Kepler uh, for your uh, Cosmos keys? Awesome. Uh, when it comes to Ethereum keys, how many of you guys use uh, MetaMask? All right. Um, there's, uh, there's another extension, uh, XDeFi. Uh, it allows you to uh, deal with Bitcoin. How many use XDeFi? Awesome. So when you visit Shapeshift, these extensions uh, plug into the website and it shows you the balance of all of your uh, keys. It shows you the history of your portfolio and with a single click, you can trade. But whereas yesterday you used to trade with Shapeshift, Today, it hooks into all of the DeFi uh, uh, protocols that we know and love. If you're trading Osmo, um, it, uh, it uses uh, Osmosis. If you're, if you're trading anything on Ethereum, it'll use Uniswap. If you're trading native Bitcoin, it will use ThorChain. All of these are brought under one hood. And um, through, the, through this process of giving people access to their own crypto without uh, requiring them to give uh, KYC, we realized that the biggest thing getting in the way of you using your crypto was us, was Shapeshift US itself. So in 2021, Shapeshift made the decision to shut down itself, lay off all employees, and open source our software to become a DAO. Uh, we held the largest airdrop uh, uh, for the Fox token, giving it to um, uh, community members uh, far and wide, and today, uh, people who hold the Fox token, the Shapeshift token, can vote on how this platform can evolve. Um, and it's, it, uh, it was really interesting to, to see this uh, fight for freedom, this fight for uh, personal privacy from the inside, um, because where we started with a very frictionless way to swap crypto, through our evolution, we ended up being the easiest, most frictionless way to access your crypto. And all the swapping, all the exchanging that people want to do, uh, we let the swap protocols, the exchange protocols like Osmosis, ThorChain, Uniswap, they handle the swaps. All we handle is a simple and easy to use interface for your crypto. So um, privacy means a lot to myself and to all of the former Shapeshift employees, and today all the Shapeshift DAO members who continue to fight to give you access to your data in a way, sorry, to give you access to your crypto in a way that doesn't require you to give up your data. Yeah, and <laughs> give it up for Shapeshift. So, so, so you guys were the earliest, or I would say the first generation uh, of companies that kind of felt the wrath of regulatory overreach. And it wasn't until Uniswap before we kind of figured out a way to do decentralized exchange really effectively without having to do KYC. So now, you know, we're at the third generation of um, blockchain tech right now, and there's another instance of overreach. How many of you guys have heard of Tornado Cash? Right. So <laughs> we need to talk about yeah, we need to talk about the concept of base layer neutrality and this is the fight that we need to be fighting right now because if we let the regulators continue reaching over and stifling innovation um, in the crypto community, then we're not going to be able to reach the destination that we all set out to do. So base layer neutrality, what is that? It's this concept of well, a blockchain is just infrastructure, the way that telephone lines or HTTP is, and it should be treated as such. You can't classify a node operator or developers of code as um, money transmitters or, or, or anything like that. So, that being said, you can't really justify getting a validator to censor transactions of certain, uh, coming from certain addresses. Um, and now, yeah, we're at this critical juncture. I want to know what the panelists think about the possibility of an OFAC chain and, and a permissionless chain. What does that look like? Um, well, 
when, when these Ethereum smart contracts are running, uh, anybody can use them. But when one organization, for example, OFAC, says, uh, no, if you interact with this one smart contract, this specific smart contract, well, now you're, you're breaking the law. That breaks the concept of uh, protocol neutrality. That makes it more difficult for all of us to use the tokens that we want to use. We paid good money to earn these tokens. Uh, 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 whether you worked for your, uh, your tokens or um, you, you bought them um, uh, in exchange with your own money, uh, they are yours. And uh, in the same way that um, we, are, we were used to banks before uh, telling us, well, no, you can't send your money over there because we tell you no. Uh, that was obviously uh, an overreach for uh, money neutrality. Ban banks uh, prevented you from, uh, from sending your own money. So uh, these blockchains and cryptocurrency in spe uh, specifically, they uh, returned the power to the people uh, with uh, this neutrality. But now that um, uh, OFAC or uh, other organizations are starting to encroach on the neutrality of these blockchains, uh, we need to uh, pay attention and we need to uh, take advantage of all the tools that we have uh, with us. Um, one of the, the brightest shining stars, I believe, uh, in the Cosmos ecosystem and something that will protect the Cosmos ecosystem in a way that the Ethereum ecosystem is not similarly protected is the secret network. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you love the secret network. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan uh, myself. But the, the Ethereum uh, community doesn't have something like the secret network that can uh, pr protect itself. Tornado Cash uh, was, a, a, was a great attempt with the technology that they had available with the Ethereum virtual machine. But what's amazing about uh, the secret network is that it can offer a shield for the entire cosmos, not just for the secret blockchain itself. Um, if, uh, if any of you saw uh, Tor Bear's presentation yesterday about the future of the secret network, uh, he talked about a lot of really, really uh, amazing features that allow other blockchains uh, in the Cosmos ecosystem, for example, a smart contract on Juno or uh, uh, something on, uh, on Osmosis, they can take advantage of some of these secret network features even though they are not on the secret blockchain themselves. And that can offer a shield to protect the privacy of users that want to have privacy uh, and can give dissidents in whatever country a way out. And I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that this shield will help to protect the Cosmos ecosystem in the way that the Ethereum network could not protect themselves. Thank you. Yusuf, so you talked a little bit about Peter Thiel's book, The Sovereign Individual. Is that what you said? So what about the concept of the sovereign family? So in this Web 2 paradigm, it's scary to raise children where it's, you put an iPad in front of them and they get addicted to social media and there's all sorts of mental disorders that are a result of it. And this idea of Web 3 is one such that we could kind of innovate our way out of that uh, paradigm that's completely um, dominated by the AI algos. So what do you think about preserving the sovereign family in this world that we're innovating towards? I do not have a perfect answer to uh, your question, but I would uh, circle back on something else, which is um, the book of, uh, of Balaji where he talked about uh, the network state. So you can have the sovereign individual and then a collection, a collection of sovereign individuals would give you uh, um, a, basically uh, a society of, of sovereign individuals. And before, when in the current state of affairs, uh, what, what happens is that you, you are born in a country and then you have to abide uh, by the rules. So what crypto uh, enables basically is to decide for yourself, which is clearly an act of sovereignty. So as a community, you can at some point uh, decide to opt out from the current system where you are and build your own set of rules. Uh, and then what happens is that the consensus uh, is much better. So in a traditional democracy, usually you would have two or three parties and then the winning party maybe owns 51% or 55% of the votes and then 45% of the people that didn't win uh, are not happy with the, with the end result and that, create, that can create frictions. In the case of the network state, 
everyone that is everyone is aligned basically so if you want to build your crypto network state and I, I know that it's not reality yet but I, I think that at some point we're gonna see it then there is a, a total consensus where 100% of the people within a network abide by the same rules and accept the same rules and they embrace them and that I think will uh, greatly uh, reduce friction within uh, a specific community and that would bring more I would say uh, social peace and uh, and less friction thank you and with that let's close with what each of you guys are doing in crypto what are you doing in crypto why are you here well I'm here um, because I'm starting to work with NIM so um, bueno voy a volver al español perdón eh, se me había olvidado <laughs> Um, to work with NIM and helping to increase uh, the node network to allow operations to be anonymous and non-traceable. I'm worried about the tornado cash. The Treasury Department not only can sanction people company but now they can attack protocols and that leave us leaves us very vulnerable and the whole ecosystem of cosmos uh, it can be affected or at least we are at the risk for many things so from here that's my contribution and that is with the events organization with diffusion i help technically because i come from the system engineering world and those that want to build the node understand our tokenization system to have a reward system i want to facilitate networks that will help people work and be protected at the same time and maybe the states shouldn't have any part here um yeah so uh, uh as i mentioned earlier the, the shapeshift company shut itself down to decentralize itself but right now the shapeshift dao has a very ever-present problem and that is we are still using centralized servers on aws for our back end uh, the front end has been completely decentralized, hosted on Git repositories and IPFS. So even if the, the Shapeshift domain gets seized, the, uh, the Shapeshift application servers get shut down, Shapeshift will continue to allow all of you to access your crypto for free. But the back end is still centralized. Uh, Foxchain is a new Cosmos-based blockchain that we are building. Uh, I'm spearheading the project uh, that should allow everybody to run their own a, a Bitcoin server connected to a directory and earn passive income. And this will allow all Shapeshift users and indeed all users of any other uh, um, application to find a Bitcoin server to get Bitcoin data or find an Ethereum server to get Ethereum data without relying on centralized servers run by any company that can be shut down or sanctioned in the way that we saw in uh, Infura block uh, Tornado Cache's access to their uh, RPC servers. So I'm, uh, I'm very uh, privileged to be working on such a, an, an important mission at the Shapeshift DAO. Yusuf. Yeah, so I would say I'm in crypto because I, I absolutely love the, the, the innovation, the amount of innovation that is in this space. I think uh, anything is possible and blockchain for me is probably one of the first technology that is 100% at the service of people and making them uh, more more sovereign and I think we're pushing a lot of boundaries uh, and yeah that's pretty much it all right and with that I think we can conclude that this is for all of us and none of us at the same time and I'll just leave this on the table for you guys to think about why are you ultimately here what are you building towards mm. and, and if the answer is to make a lot of money then that's completely <laughs> uninspiring by the way. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And that's this is the last conference. This is the last panel.